Okay, so uh, hopefully uh, you, you'll you'll have a you're you, you're well on your way to being done with homework two or assignment two uh, by this Friday midnight. Remember that you still have hack five, uh, six. As this is the sixth week, so you have hack six due this Friday as well. That you'll start tomorrow. Uh, you'll be using a uh, a more formal testing framework called CMACA. It, it's not important to understand the, uh, the all the details uh, of CMACA. Understand though that you have to use uh, you, uh, CMACA is installed on the CSE uh, computers, and so if you're going to try to do this yourself on your own computers, you're going to have to figure out a way to install CMACA. So uh, make sure make sure that uh, you're doing it on the uh, the, the CSE computer instead. Um, it's a more formal testing framework that basically takes care of all of the details of running all the tests, adding up, uh, reporting whether or not they passed or failed, adding up all the totals, and then reporting a total. It takes care of all that boilerplate for you. Uh, it can, uh, but to understand how it works requires a, 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 a quite a bit uh, more than we've already covered. Uh, but that's okay because we are giving you an example, and you work off of that example. So just simply uh, look at the uh, look at the example that we give you uh, and emulate that uh, to test your functions for uh, uh, for for that uh, for that hack tomorrow. Uh, C Maca is well, it stands for C, but also Maca is. Uh, I, I think the original project was called Mockery. A mock, a, a mock is basically like a mock-up, or you're mocking up data. You're creating uh, mock data, fake data, in order to test your program. And so that's where that gets that name. Yeah? Yeah, you're supposed to write several functions, but to test those functions, uh, like in ha the last hack, you, uh, you had to write an ad hoc tester. right? So you were doing all the boilerplate yourself. You wrote three tes test cases for each function, so there were nine test cases in your utils tester. You're, now you're going to have a different utils tester, but instead of writing all that stuff for yourself, you're just simply going to have the values, right? And you, you'll have uh, you'll write the testing functions as well, maybe. Well, you, uh, you can write it anywhere, but to compile it, you're going to have to compile it on CSE, unless you want to install CMACA yourself, right? Okay. Okay. So today we're starting on uh, the next topic, which is arrays. Uh, now that we have uh, somewhat, we have uh, pointers are under our belt. Uh, we're going to uh, start to use pointers for things other than passing by reference. We're going to be using it for dynamic memory. And dynamic memory is, uh, is, is, is a, a difficult concept at first, but once you get the hang of it, you're just requesting a certain chunk of, of memory a amount of mem memory from the operating system, it gives you that chunk, then you can use that chunk of memory, and then you can give it back. Uh, and that's basically, uh, in a nutshell, what it is. Uh, the reason that you want to do this is because it's, it's rare to deal with only one piece of data. Uh, this is what you've been doing in your programs up till now. You've been declaring, say, uh, maybe two or three ints, uh, a, a few doubles or whatever. Each one of those was a single variable with its own name and one value at a time. But now what we're going to do is we're going to create a collection of data. Uh, usually, you ha uh, have more than one number, or more, or more than one string, or more than one object. We're not going to get into objects too much yet, but uh, that you do have kind of quasi-objects in, in C. Uh, we'll be doing that later. Uh, that have to be stored, be stored, and processed. Right? In C, collections of similar data can be stored in arrays. And similar types of data is what I should say. Uh, because you, uh, an, an array is going to store a collection of integers, or it's going to store a collection of doubles, or it's going to store a collection of characters. And then you have a string, which is the next topic. Uh, so we won't get into that just yet. Uh, but uh, you can't have an array. In some languages, you can do this, but in C, you can't. Uh, it's, it's strongly typed or statically typed, however you want to put it. Uh, an, an array can hold only integers. If you declare it to be an integer array, it only holds integers. If you declare it to be a double array, it only holds doubles. So you can't have your double array suddenly hold integer values. You can put 10 in it, but it, it will store it as 10.0. Uh, but if you try to store 10.5 in an integer array, that's not going to work. It's going to truncate it, just like it's been truncating your stuff up till now. Uh, arrays have a single name, that is identifier, right? 
and you can access individual elements. So each, ele uh, each, uh, each item in the array is called an element in an array using an index. Right? An index is like an index card, right? It tell, uh, you, you go to the index cards and you're, you look for things. Oh, here, here's the index card corresponding to that thing or that book or whatever. Uh, indices, or arrays, I should say, are zero indexed. Indexed. The first element is at index zero. The second element is at index one. The third is at index two, etc. If there are n elements in the array, what is where is the last one? N minus one. The last the last element is at index n minus 1. Right? And I, I'll, I made that a little bit mathematic, ma mathematical, right? Uh, indexing is achieved using the square brackets. And you've kind of had a preview of this before when you worked with command line arguments. The first command line argument was at argv sub 0, and then you used the square brackets. The second one was at argv sub 1. So it, it was 0 indexed, right? Your R was off by 1. The first one was always the executable file name. So you could always say that the first real uh, command line argument was at index 1. Okay? So those are the basics. Let's go ahead and look at how we can start, doing, uh, how, so how we can start using these. To get started, I'm going to show you what are called static arrays. Now, in practice, in general, you should not use static arrays, but at least it gets us started uh, understanding how to use arrays. Uh, static arrays are arrays of a fixed size that are allocated, uh, allocated on top of the program stack. Remember the program stack? Function calls function, calls function, calls function. And each function call creates its own stack frame. So if you've got a static array, that's, that array, all of the elements will exist within that one Sta uh, w w that one uh, 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 stack frame, right? Uh, that call stack frame. Now, what happens when this uh, this function returns back to the calling function? Remember what happens to that stack frame? It gets popped off and thrown away. That's one reason that you don't want to use static arrays in practice, because they're local to the function. They only exist within the function, uh, and once you return, they're destroyed. If you want your data to be persisted across multiple different uh, function calls, it needs to be allocated somewhere else, and that's going to be dynamic memory. I'll show you a, d a demonstration here uh, by the end of the day showing you why, uh, again, you don't want to do this. All right? So here's our syntax, though, uh, because, again, it, it will help us understand how to use arrays. So let's go ahead and create an array to hold 10 integers. Right? Int arr 10. The name of my array is just AR. If it was representing, you know, uh, NUIDs, you might want to call it NUIDs. If it was representing uh, box scores or something like that, then you would call, uh, you would name that variable whatever you want to, uh, whatever it, it represents. I'm not representing anything in particular here, so I'll go ahead and use the shorthand ARR, for, short for array, right? Or you could call it numbers. Let's go ahead and create an array that can hold 20 double values. So using the first one as an example, what do you think we should do? I should change the type to double. I certainly need to call it something else. Let's call it numbers in this case. And then I need to provide a size, 20. Right? Okay. That number in the, uh, in the de these are just declarations. I'm just declaring them. What's stored in this, these arrays at this point? If I just declared an, in, uh, an integer int n, oops, sorry, int, n, uh, int x, let's say, what's stored in the variable x at this point in the code? It hasn't been initialized. So who knows? Could be, could be 0, could be negative 1, could be garbage, could be dead beef. Likewise, what's stored in my arrays? Who knows? Could be 0, could be negative 1, could be some flag values, could be dead beef. So there's nothing, uh, nothing particular stored in an array when you, do, uh, when you initially declare it. All right? So observation. Uh, just like any other uh, uninitialized.
initialized variable, there are no default values for array elements. Right? So we're going to have to set it. Right? We're going to have to set the values in the, in the array. Uh, once we've declared an array, we can access the first element at index what? What was it again? Zero, because it's zero indexed. Once I provide the name of the array, square brackets, and inside the square brackets, I put the element that I want, uh, the, the, number, the, the index that I want to access, I can do, treat it like a normal, regular old variable. I can set this equal to 42, right? This sets the first element to 42. How would I set the second element? ARR sub 1 is equal to, I don't know, 12. Right? ARR sub 2, what if I set that to 3.14? What value is stored there? Sorry, there we go. So remember, can, can you store double values into an array that holds integer values? Nope. So what happens when you try to uh, assign a value, uh, a, uh, a double value to an integer? Truncation, right? Truncation makes this three, right? So truncation will occur when you're working with arrays. Let's set the last element to three point, or I don't know, uh, th uh, to uh, 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 seventeen, right? Ar, what's where's the last element? How big was the array? I declared it to be of size 10, so where would the last one be? 9, right? What would happen if I tried to go past that set? Uh, or what would happen here? Question mark. AR sub 10 is equal to uh, 12. Right? Is that the 10th element? That's the 11th element, remember, because we start at 0. Is there an 11th element when you've got an array of size 10? No. So here's your world. Your world is flat when it concerns arrays. And you set the first one, you set the second one, you set the third one, et cetera, et cetera. You set the last one, you try to set after the last one. What happens? You fall off the edge of the world. So this is undefined behavior, accessing elements outside the uh, uh, bounds of uh, an array is undefined behavior. This is, a famous, uh, th uh, this is a famous term in C programming. What does undefined behavior mean? Whatever you want it to mean, because it's undefined. It's up to the compiler. It's up to the operating system. It might even be up to whatever the, was on the machine be, uh, to begin with, uh, what other, whatever other processes are running at the time that you invoke this program. It could crash with a segmentation fault. Hopefully it does. It could corrupt your own memory. It could uh, end up accessing illegal memory that doesn't belong to you, and you might get away with it, in which case you found a vulnerability, a vulnerability that you can then exploit if you really wanted to inject a, a, you know, a malicious code into a system or something like that. Right? So undefined behavior, you could corrupt your own memory. You could corrupt uh, other memory and uh, end up with a segmentation fault. Right? Uh, uh, otherwise, uh, you, you could simply get garbage results. Right? Anything could happen because anything can happen with undefined behavior. Okay. So uh, you, know, you can set one by one if you really want to. Here's a ni another nice convenient, uh, uh, here's a con convenience syntax. If you want to, uh, if you want to uh, uh, like set all the elements of an array immediately for, this is especially useful for test values. Uh, if you want to create an array without having to write 10 different lines of code to set 10 different elements, you can do something like this. I'm going to go ahead and create a, an array to hold the first seven prime numbers int primes is equal to, what are the first seven prime numbers? 2, 3, 5, 7, uh, 11, 13, 17. Do I have 7 there? Yep, there we go. So there's, the, there, there's nice little convenient syntax by which you can create an array and immediately set it all of its values. The first one at primes of 0 will be equal to 2. Where's the last one? What, what's the index for the last one, by the way? So if there are seven of them, 
and I start at 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Right? So it'll be a primes of 6 is equal to 17. Now, why did I create that n up there? Right? Note, uh, with this syntax, the compilers are generally dumb, but compilers can at least count. Compilers can go through and see, oh, you wanted seven elements. OK, I'll go ahead and create an array of size seven. This is also perfectly acceptable if you explicitly put seven in there, but it's not absolutely necessary. This is a technical term called elision. Uh, eliminating el uh, redundant information or information that can be inferred by the compiler. You elide something. You, you take something away. Uh, what's an example of elision in speech? Um, oh, dang it. I can't think of anything off the top of my head other than uh, somebody, uh, somebody wa wants to know, did you already eat lunch today? Did you eat? Right? Did you eat? Right? You were shortening that speech. You were alighting your speech to make it shorter. Right? You do this all the time in speech. It's called elision. And in programming languages, they're languages, so they also have elision, where you, take, uh, you, you, drop cons you drop syllables or you drop consonants so that you can shorten up your speech. And that's what this is. It's elision. So it's a 25-cent word there if you want to remember that. Uh, don't worry about it, though. All right? So I alighted away the size of the, uh, the array here, but I kept it in uh, a, a, a value above. Right? In the example above, the compiler will take care of properly sizing the array for us. Great. However, it is still our responsibility to keep track of the size of the array. And that is usually done by putting it into uh, the size of the array into an integer variable and then passing that variable around. Where whoever, whoever's going to process your array is going to need to know how big it is. So you keep that into a variable, and then you pass that variable along to a function, or you return it from a function, or something like that. You also need, uh, you'll always need to do your own bookkeeping. Keeping track of the size of an array and making sure you don't go out of bounds is called bookkeeping. All right? You always need to do your own bookkeeping. And see. Right? If you don't, then you will eventually have corrupted memory, or you'll, uh, you'll have a segmentation fault, hopefully. Right? So what, now that we know how we have to keep our own bookkeeping, again, how do we keep track of the sizing, uh, sizing and iterations, iterating over an array? Right. So you always, uh, you, uh, there, uh, you might eventually read like a blog post or maybe a Stack Overflow example or maybe just some random blog online that, uh, show, that claims to teach C programming or something like that. And quite often, I will see way too many examples out in the wild that say, Oh, to, to determine the, the size of an array, you can do this. Uh, or you can do this. Now, 50% of those examples are only working because they only work on static arrays, uh, where the compiler can, can detect, or the, the compiler of the runtime environment can detect how big those arrays are. However, in general, just remember this. There is no, absolutely, absolutely no way to de consistently determine the size of an array in C. Right? There is no way. Uh, it's not built into the language. Some languages, like uh, say Java, if you create a, an array, then they've got this uh, property that you can look up that it's length. Uh, other languages keep track of that in some other way and let you, let you call uh, uh, functions to determine how big an array is. There's nothing like that in C. Nothing that consistently across platform uh, on any type of array will be able to tell you how big it is. Therefore, again, you must keep track of the size of an array in some variable. Right. Usually, we use n. Or, oh, I'll, I'll go ahead and codize that there. there. n as the size of an array, or you know, size, or something like that that tells you the size of an array. Uh, if you pass an array to a function, you also need to tell the function how big the array is. 
right? Because the array, uh, the function is presumably going to process it and iterate over all the elements in the array and uh, and work with it. It needs to know how many elements are in there. Uh, if you want to create a function to print all the elements in an array, it needs to know how many things am I going to be printing here? The first element, the second element, the fifth element, uh, dot, 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 the last element. It needs to know where that last element is so it doesn't fall off the edge of the earth at, uh, the, or edge of the array world uh, and uh, go out of bounds. Okay? Uh, so let's look at an example. Example. Right? So uh, let's go ahead and Iterate, uh, I'll iterate over the uh, previous primes array and print out each element. Right. So uh, let me go ahead and cut, cut and paste the example from before so that I don't have to scroll up and look at the code again. So I want to go ahead and print each one of these out, maybe one to a line. Suggestions. Obviously, I'm going to need to use a loop. Which one is more natural to use, a while loop or a for loop? For loop, why? Because you know up front how many things are in the array, right? So for int i, right, for int i equals, where should I start? At 0, index 0, that's the first element. Uh, the first element is at index 0. i is less than, in this case, how many elements are there in there? 7, so I could put 7. Otherwise, what else could I put instead? I could use the variable that I designated for the size of the array, n, right? i plus plus. Go up by one each time, and then just simply print it out. Uh, print. Uh, let's go with a percent d and the line. What should I be printing? Prime sub. This is why I called it an index variable before, right? Because now we're going to actually be using it as an index to an array. I'll use i. Right? I'll put i in there. What that does is that accesses the ith element, prints it out over here. Let's, let's examine this uh, loop a little bit closer, though. What does i run from, and uh, what does it run up to? It starts at 0 and then goes up by 1. So the first iteration will be 0. Second is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 6 is strictly less than 7. And then what about 7? Is there a... Is there a a, uh, a seventh element? There's a seventh element, but is there an element at index seven? No. So it stops. That's, uh, the, the strictly less than ensures that we don't go off the edge of the array. Right? And this is typically how you iterate over an array. If you wanted to add them all up, right? sum plus equals uh, prime sub i. Right? Let me go ahead and create that variable, int sum. Ooh. Here's a good question. Is this good code? This is a review question here. Focus on that third line, int sum. Again, what's in that variable? Could be 0, could be negative 1, could be some flag value, value, could be dead beef, could be garbage. If it's garbage and we add 2 to it, what do we get? What's garbage plus 2? Still garbage. If I want to take a sum, what should I do with that variable? Initialize it to 0. Always initialize your variables. All right, good. Uh, let's see. Let's take a little bit of a digression here. A variable length arrays, All right? VLAs. So in some modern C, uh, like say C99 uh, or C99, uh, GNU C89, etc., uh, you can uh, create what are called variable length arrays. Right. Let me go ahead and do that now. Uh, I'll go ahead and create int n is equal to, I don't know, 10. Right. Uh, and then I'll go ahead and create int ar sub n. This is a little bit different syntax. Here we go. This is a little bit different syntax that, uh, than what I introduced above in that I'm not putting a hard-coded value into the size of the array. This will still create an ar integer array of size 10. It can hold 10 elements, so it, its indexing is going to be 0 through 9, just as before. But it, uh, and it, it, it's uninitialized. I don't know what's in there. Uh, but I, the thing is, I, I don't have to set this to 10. I could read this in from the user, right? I could uh, say, to be read in from the user via scanf, right? if you really wanted to do something like this. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. 
All right. This would um, uh, in in most in many cases, this ends up uh, 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 causing a segmentation fault. Right. Why? To understand this, let me go ahead and go over to REPL here. And let's get rid of this. Uh, let's go over here. All right, and let's go ahead and increase the size. There we go. So I've got something that looks like this. Uh, I'm, I've got a VLA, a, a, a variable length array here, right? Uh, and I'm going to create it of size, uh, of size 10. Uh, and there's my variable length array. It's of size 10. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to set the last element here, which is going to be n minus 1, to 42. This should work, right? and it does. What if I wanted to create an, uh, an array of size 100? That'll still work. What about, let's go up to, there's a 1,000, there's a million. Mm, OK, let's just try that. Still works. What about 10 million? And now it dies. Why? Is it just way too big? No, no, no modern computer can hold 10 million values, right? That's nonsense. What was, what was the, what, what, what's the difference here between a million and 10 million? Well, times 10, right? But think about where static arrays are created. This is the demonstration I was talking about before. When you create a static array, you've got, you've got the main function here. Then you call another function. You call another function, et cetera. With this example, we've only got one function. Where is this array being created? On the stack. Do you remember what happens when you stack too many dishes on top of each other? They overflow, right? This stack is limited. It's limited to about, say, 4 megabytes of memory, or 8 megabytes, whatever, whatever is on the system. Right? Now, when I do a, a million, is this still a million? Yep. When I do a million, how many bytes are in an integer? Four. So if I create an array of, of 1 million uh, integers, I'm asking for 4 million bytes which is just under 4 megabytes. Right? So this is perfectly fine. What if I even will go up to, say, 2 million? Now I'm asking for 2 million times 4, 8 million bytes, which is going to be just shy of 8 megabytes. Right? That's probably, oh, OK, so the stack size is OK there. Let's uh, go ahead and go up to, uh, say, 12 megabytes, just under 12 megabytes. OK, there we go. So somewhere between 8 megabytes and 12 megabytes is how much uh, stack space is, the REPL is giving you. Right? Certainly, if I go up to 10 million, like I was doing before, 10 million times 4 is 40 million, uh, 40 million bytes, which is reasonably small. Right? That's only 40 megabytes. Right? Uh, any, uh, all of your systems are in the gigabytes. Right? But it's not able to do that because it's on the call stack. The call stack is limited. You only have about 4, 8, apparently 10 megabytes in your call stack. If you create too many, uh, too, uh, an array of, the, of, si of a size that is going to exceed that, uh, that stack, then all of your dishes are going to fall with a stack overflow. And that's exactly what's happening here. So there's nothing to prevent you from doing this with a scanf, right? If I just have n here, uh, and I'll, I'll set it to 0 here, and then I'll go scanf, uh, percent %d. Uh, and then read it in. There we go. Oops. Ah, can't type today. There we go. All right. Let's go ahead and run this. All right. It's, I didn't prompt, so uh, I'll, I'll enter in 10. 10 should work. And let's run it again. But if I entered in 10, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, uh, that's 10 million, then of course you're going to have that stack overflow. There's no code here preventing that. I would have to actually determine what the stack size is, and I've never found a, a, a good way of doing that inside of a, a C program. That's a system level thing that you'd have to run some commands on. Uh, but inside of a C program, I, it's, not, uh, it's definitely not possible that in an interoperable way. So there's no way to prevent bad executions like this. Right? So just because you can do something like variable length arrays does not mean that you should do something like this. Just because you can use uh, VLAs doesn't mean you should. And actually, you shouldn't. All right. All right. So uh, in, what's our solution here? Instead, let's use dynamic arrays. Right. 
There are also other uh, drawbacks to using static arrays and variable length arrays, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about those later. All right? So bef uh, before we talk about that, though, we need to look at the alternative. How do you use dynamic arrays? So this call stack, the stack is not where we want to be allocating large amounts of memory. Obviously, do we do want to we want to be able to allocate large amounts of memory. I want I want uh, a billion integers. I want ten billion integers. I want gigabytes of data because I'm going to be processing stuff, right? Uh, really important stuff. Uh, so, where do I allocate my memory? You allocate it on somewhere else called the heap. All right. So, what are dynamic arrays? Come on, let me get let me shorten this up. There we go. Uh, dynamic arrays are arrays whose memory is allocated not on the stack, but on the uh, in another part of memory called the heap. Generally, generally, the heap is less organized, uh, slightly less efficient, but much larger. Right. So that stack function call function call function so that you can push a stack frame, push a stack frame, push a stack frame is extremely efficient because to return back to the calling function, you just have to take that stack frame off. St take the stack frame off. Take the stack frame off. That's an extremely efficient way to use memory. Uh, the heap, on the other hand, is something a little bit different. It, the, the stack is highly organized. W when, you, when I say heap, what do you think of, of a heap? Kind of like a trash heap, like, right? How do you put stuff onto a heap? Yeah, you just throw it on top, exactly. Where does it end up if you throw it at the top? Does it always end up at the top? Uh, it rolls down maybe randomly, right? So it's a little bit less organized. Uh, but still, and it's, uh, that makes it a little bit less efficient. But imagine a, uh, a stack of dishes where you can only put in maybe uh, 20, uh, 20 or 30 dishes before it falls over and gets unbalanced. A heap, well, the heap can be as big as you want, as big as you, at least your computer will allow. Uh, so you can, uh, you can uh, throw stuff onto the heap as much as you want. Uh, where it, it's less organized, it's less efficient, but it's a heck of a lot bigger. Right? You can allocate megabytes upon megabytes or gigabytes upon gigabytes of data onto the heap. Right? Uh, generally, uh, you can dynamically allocate memory on the heap using a function in the standard library called malloc. What do you think malloc stands for? Malloc. You're allocating what again? Memory. So alloc would be allocation. So you're using memory allocation, right? This is memory allocation. Right? This is not the only one, by the way. There's also uh, calloc, realloc, and a couple of other variants, but we're only going to focus on malloc. Right? Keep it simple. Let's uh, just use one of these things. Right? You give malloc, oops, and by the way, again, it's in the standard library, stdlib. This is why you should always be including stdlib. Uh, and uh, so if you've been doing that, you've already been including this. Uh, but you give out malloc one argument, the number of bytes you want to allocate. Well, that presents a problem here, because do you want to do you want to always remember that an integer is four bytes? So if you want uh, if you want, for example, uh, an array to hold ten integers, do you want to always want to be doing the math yourself of I want ten integers? Uh, uh, an integer is four bytes again, so that's going to be forty bytes. Give me forty bytes. Right? An integer is not always four bytes on every single system. In fact, the C standard only requires it to be a minimum of two bytes, which only allows you to, uh, to express up to 16,000, right? Uh, about 16,000. Uh, most systems, most modern systems, are going to be four bytes, so you can get away with that. But if you want to write a system interoperable code, that is code that will work on this system and this system and this system and any system that you port it over to, you need to be more general. You need to be able to determine, determine on this system, with this compiler and this operating system, how many bytes does an integer take? Right? It could be four. It could be two. It could be eight. Right? It could be anything. Right? So uh, generally, you can use can use the size of 
macro. Uh, it's, not, it's not a function, it's a macro, macro to determine how many bytes each integer or each uh, element takes. Right? Uh, if successful, right, you asked for, say, 40 megabytes. If, if successful, uh, malloc returns a pointer to the memory it allocated. Uh, if unsuccessful, it returns, what do you think? You asked it for 40, megabyte, um, 40 megabytes. OK, here you go. Uh, I allocated this chunk of memory here, 40 megabytes for you. I need a way of telling you where it is. Well, it's right there. What, what did I just give you? A pointer. Right? I'm pointing to where uh, that memory is located. What if I can't do that? What if you asked me for, I don't know, 50 terabytes? I, let, we'll try it on REPL here, see if they can give me 50 terabytes. What do you think? I can't do that. That's way too big. So what kind of a pointer can I return to indicate that's not valid? Null, exactly. It returns null if it's unsuccessful. Let's just look at an example here. I'm going to need a pointer to the, uh, to the array that is ultimately allocated. So the way that I can create a pointer is int ARR with a star in front of it. Remember, this is how you declare a pointer. Now, this isn't the, the best code. What am I missing here? What is it pointing to at this point? Nothing. It could be pointing to a random memory location that doesn't belong to me. It could be pointing to a non-existent memory location. Who knows? What's the best practice when you create a pointer? Immediately, uh, immediately make it point to null, right? so that you're not getting some weird uh, random memory address. Okay. So now what we're going to do is let's, well, we want to allocate enough memory for 1 million integers. Uh, to do that, I will call malloc. Right. And uh, actually, before that, uh, let's go ahead and create a variable here. Int n is equal to 1 million, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. There we go. Because again, you need to keep, uh, do your own bookkeeping. You need to remember that when you created this uh, array of, of, of 1 million integers, that uh, you, you stored that off into a, a variable so you don't go out of bounds. Right? Uh, what about this? Uh, ARR is equal to this. This is, our, this is my first attempt here. malloc returns a pointer, so I'll put that into ARR. That's fine for now. n, how many, uh, wh remember, what, wh what, is, what does malloc uh, want, want to know? It doesn't want to know how many integers you want. It doesn't want to know how many doubles you want. It wants to know how many bytes you want. So by writing this code here, I've asked for a million bytes. Is that going to cover a million integers? Nope. How many bytes do I need if I need a million integers? Four million, right? So again, should I do this? Four times n. On some systems, on most systems, in fact, this will work. But it's not the best. How many bytes does an integer take? You use that size of macro. And then you provide, inside of it, you provide the type of variable you want to create. And this is pretty good. Right? One other uh, technical thing here is I'm going to, uh, this is called typecasting, int star. I'll come back and explain that in a, in a, in a, in a bit. Okay? But there, that's perfect. I've now create, uh, allocated enough memory for 1 million integers. Let's take this over to REPL and see if we can uh, uh, successfully do this now. Instead of a, instead of a, a, a variable length uh, array of size 10 million uh, that we couldn't do before, let's go ahead and create an array of size 10 million dynamically uh, somewhere else on the heap. Now, is this going to work? Let's find out. Uh, everything looks good, except for you need to include the standard library. And all right, let's try it. I don't see any pro obvious problems yet. All right. Oh, what's up? Size of int. I included you. Error, error, uh, oh, oh, duh. I got rid of the declaration. ARR is equal to null. There we go. Now let's run this. OK, it's prompting me. So 100, it, it, it'll certainly work. That only created, an, uh, that only requested. Uh, uh, a, a memory chunk of 400 bytes, which 
is, is small. In fact, it probably gave me more technically because you don't want to get, be getting into small amounts of memory. It, uh, memory is chopped up into things called pages. And pages are generally at least one kilobyte. So if you ask for something that's less than one kilobyte, you're going to get an entire page anyway. Uh, and, th and that's how memory actually works. Uh, but anyway, let's go ahead and try it again. Four, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three. So there's a million. Let's try it for 10 million. Remember, it didn't work before. Because I could not allocate 40 million bytes on the call stack. Now I'm, cal uh, uh, I'm allocating it on the heap. Will it work? Yep, works just fine. You can create 40 megabytes on the heap. You can create 100 megabytes on the heap. Uh, you can create, well, let's try it one more time. Can I create, uh, let's see, 100 million, one, two, three, one, two, three. This is going to be 400 million bytes, so 400 megabytes about. I'm just shy of, and it still works. Let's do one more. One billion, one, two, three, one, two, three. Four billion bytes is just shy of how much? Four gigabytes, right? And it works perfectly. You can create as much memory as you want, right? Uh, now, if you go crazy about it, uh, I, don't, I don't think that this will work because we'll have overflow anyway. Uh, but uh, let's go ahead and try. Two, one, four, seven, one, two, three, one, two, three. Uh, I'm keeping it under so that there's no overflow here, but uh, I'm asking basically for as much, uh, as much memory as I can with an integer. And it still works. Uh, 2.1 billion times four, that's going to be uh, 8.4 billion. So you're, ta you're talking about, uh, a little, about eight gigabytes there. And it was able to give it to me. Right? Uh, you have plenty of memory on your computer but you don't have plenty of memory on your call stack. And this is why we want to use dynamic arrays going forward. So anything that you're doing in this course from now on with arrays, it's probably going to be dynamic arrays. You don't want to be using static arrays or certainly not a variable length argument arrays, okay? Let's do the same thing, but for integers. So example two, create, uh, create an array for, I don't know, uh, 10,000 doubles, right? What would be different? First of all, I would need a different variable to hold 10,000. There we go. Uh, how would I call everything else differently? I need a pointer, right? How would that pointer be different? It would be double star, and I'll call it numbers just because of the, the example before. Uh, and instead of, uh, I could uh, assign this immediately to null uh, and then call malloc, but I'll go ahead and call malloc all in one line. Declare it and call malloc. Right. Now, what should I get, tell malloc? Should I tell it that I want m doubles? Uh, again, that's wrong. That's only 10,000 bytes. How many bytes are in a double? Do you remember? It's not four, it's eight. Right. So I need. 80,000 bytes in order to hold 10,000 doubles. So again, do I do it times eight? Nope. I do size of double. Right? And that's how you can create dynamic arrays. Now, the one thing that I left off here was that typecast. I'll go ahead and put that in now. But instead of an, uh, typecasting it to double or to an integer, I'll typecast it to a double. Right? So size of size of, excuse me, can be used to determine how many bytes each element, uh, each type of element takes on a particular system. Right? In general, this is something new here, uh, malloc returns a generic void pointer. What the heck is that? To understand that, I'm going to go to the actual documentation here. Right. Man malloc. I'm looking up the man pages on malloc here. Right. And here, here are all the uh, other variants, calloc, malloc, realloc, realloc, cf, valloc, right. a bunch of other ones. Uh, here, uh, allocates and returns a pointer to the allocated memory. So let's, uh, let's pay attention to the, uh, the signature here of malloc. Where is it? Right there. 
So it takes a size, uh, how many bytes you want. Uh, but what does it return here? Void star, what is that? It's a pointer, right? Because star is always going to be a pointer. But what is void? Where have we seen that a void keyword before? In what context? A function. A void function returns nothing. It returns void. Uh, a function that doesn't take any inputs, you can put void inside those parentheses or just leave it out. Right? So void means nothing. But in this context, it means anything. Right? So in a different context, the same word has a different, uh, different implication, a different meaning. In this case, it means here it's just a generic pointer. It points to this memory location over here, that memory location over there, that memory location over there. What's stored in that memory location? It doesn't care. It doesn't know. It doesn't care. You just asked me for, here I'm the operating system, you asked me for 40 megabytes. Well, here you go. Here's your 40 megabytes. Do with it whatever you want to do. Right? So that's what we mean by a void pointer here. Right? A void pointer can point to anything. A void star pointer can point to any type, uh, anything. Right? It's just, uh, it is just a generic pointer. Right? So to make a void pointer point to a particular type, we include a, uh, a an explicit explicit typecast. Right? For example, uh, int star or double star. Right? We're forcing it to become a different type so that they match. We've done this before when you tried to do integer division. If you take an int a and divide it by int b, what's going to happen? Let's say that's say 10 divided by 20. What value is that going to be? 0, because 10 divided by 20, that's 0 0.5. But it's going to have to be an integer, so what happens? Truncation. The way that we solved that problem was by taking one or the other or both variables and forcing it to become a double. So that you have a double times an integer, or divided by an integer, which gives you a double. Here I've got a generic void pointer. I just simply ask the operating system, please give me 40 megabytes. It says, OK, here you go. Now what I'm going to do with that is I'm going to say, OK, I want to store integers in that uh, memory. So I'm going to force that pointer to become an integer pointer. And it's, 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 uh, it's it's necessary in one sense because an integer takes four bytes. So when it point, points to the first one, it's looking at these four bytes and treating them as integers. And when it points to the second one, it's looking at the next four bytes, and then the next four bytes, and then the next four bytes. But if I treated it just as a generic chunk of memory, how many bytes is it pointing to? It doesn't know. Only when you tell the compiler, treat this memory as an integer, does it then know, oh, OK, I'll treat it as four byte chunks. Or I force it to, be, to treat it like a, a double, and then it looks at 8-byte chunks and interprets it one way or another. Uh, now, compiler, uh, most C, uh, in fact, every C compiler will take care of this for you generally. So it's not actually absolutely necessary that you have these explicit typecasts here. But there's, there are good arguments for why you should do it. In fact, if you read the book, uh, you should be reading the book, uh, there's a footnote in there that, uh, that uh, points to an online discussion about the merits of doing this or the merits of not doing this. And uh, it's a very, it was a very good debate. And I thought that, uh, the, that the you should do it crowd actually won out. Uh, the biggest argument, uh, the, the, the strongest argument was, if you're going to migrate your code from C to C++, you absolutely have to do this. And so it makes your code compatible with C++ code. And that's, uh, that was the end of the argument as far as I was concerned. Uh, then, uh, yeah, you should be doing this explicitly. Right? So I'm, that's the way I'm going to teach you how to do it, is you do an explicit typecast here or an explicit typecast here. Whatever uh, this thing, this, this, uh, this typecast here, has to match the type of pointer that you declared. Right? This type has to match the type that you declared. If you create an array of 10 integers and then you try to treat it as 10 doubles, well, you're going to fall off the edge of your array. Because 10 integers takes 40 bytes. But if you try to treat that as, uh, as doubles, then that only ends up being five doubles. And of course, then it's all just garbage results anyway. Okay. In fact, let's see. Can we, uh, can we do that? Let's try it. I've never tried it. Uh, let's, try, let's go ahead and create an array. 
I'll go ahead and get rid of all of this, of integers of size, say, 10. Uh, and I will go ahead and, uh, and force it to become a double. Double. There we go. And then let's set the last one to 42.5. There we go. And instead of printing a, a double, we'll go ahead and do that. Ooh. Let's find out. OK. It, it worked, but I definitely corrupted my own memory. Uh, the only reason that this worked, uh, let's try this a little bit larger. Uh, let's, uh, there we go. Right? The only reason that it didn't work, uh, that it worked in the first one, is because I told you when you ask for a small amount of memory, you're actually given a page of memory, one, one kilobyte. So if I was falling off the edge of my uh, 10, 10 uh, integers here, that's OK, because I was still within the page that I was given. I was only corrupting my own memory. If you corrupt your own memory, the operating system is fine with that. You go ahead and do whatever you want to do. Right? Uh, th that, that's what the operating system says. But if you try to corrupt other people's memory by going off of the page that you were given, then definitely it's going to exit with a segmentation fault. All right, cool. I'm glad that worked. Right. So the last item for today is memory management. Right. Once you have dynamically allocated an array, you can use it uh, like any uh, static array, right? uh, using uh, indexes, indices, uh, and the square brackets. Right? But once you are done with the array, you need to give the memory memory back to the operating system, operating system, so it can be reused. What if you don't? What if uh, what if I'm an irresponsible programmer and I ask, "Oh, give me 10 megabytes." Okay, give me another 10 megabytes. And I just let that 10 megabytes sit there, and, and I don't use it. Uh, OK, uh, well, instead of giving this back, I'll just ask for some more. Another 10 megabytes, another 10 megabytes, another 10 megabytes. The heap can handle it. You can, put as much, uh, you can allocate as much memory as is feasibly possible on your computer for as long as you want. But what's going to happen eventually? You, well, yeah, you might eventually run out of memory, but if you're, if you're taking resources and holding on to them, and not using them and not giving them back, that takes it away from other, uh, other programs in your system. Uh, Firefox, used, uh, and now Chrome, used to be uh, notorious for this. These are called memory leaks, right? Uh, that you, you allocate a bunch of memory, you, you take a bunch of memory, then you don't give it back. If you've got a long running process, like, say like a web browser, that you leave open for hours at a time, and it's taking this memory, take this, taking this memory, never giving it back. You open up a new tab, you go to a web page, it allocates memory so that it can pull that on that web page, render it, whatever. And then you close that tab, but it doesn't give that memory back. What eventually happens? It takes more and more and more and more memory until your entire system slows down to a halt. So you need to be good stewards of your resources. Uh, you need to be good stewards of your system resources. You need to free up memory uh, once, it, once you are done using it. Okay. To do that, what do you think you use? If you want to free up memory, it's going to be free. To free up memory, use a function called free. Okay. It, takes, uh, it simply takes, uh, simply takes the pointer to the memory you want to free up. Right. So let's go ahead and take an example here from, say, from last time. Uh, or not, not uh, say, uh, I'll just cut and paste this. Right. So I'm going to create an array of size 500 doubles. Uh, and th I, I do that on these two lines. I set the first one. I set the second one, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe I, maybe I print them all out. Maybe I take the average or whatever, whatever. Right, uh, and uh, then uh, I need to make sure that I free it up. So I'm at this point. I'm done with the memory. So I need to free it up. To do that, I simply go free numbers. There we go, and that's it. Now, 
I asked for that memory, I used it, I still have a pointer to it, and I say, okay, operating system, you, go, you can go ahead and take that memory back, I don't need it anymore. Maybe it gives it to another process, maybe it reuses it for your process, but what about this pointer? Should I expect that pointer to work anymore? I basically freed that up. I said, yeah, you can have it back. What if, uh, if, if I try to access it and say, oh, wait, 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 no, I didn't mean to give that back. Right? Uh, what's the first element again? Should I expect that to work? Probably not. Right? That's the, uh, the uh, once, uh, once free, once free, you cannot access that memory anymore. Anymore. You cannot expect to legally access that memory anymore. Doing so will likely be a segmentation fault or undefined behavior, defined behavior, or garbage results. Right. Unde undefined behavior. Right. Similarly, freeing memory twice is also illegal right? and probably leads to a segmentation fault. Let's try it. I'm going to go, I'm, uh, let me go ahead and grab this as an example. Right? And I'll come over here to REPL and see, let's see what happens. Let's get rid of all this. All right. All right, I'm done using it, so let's go ahead and free it up, free numbers. And let's go ahead and then print out, print F percent F and the line, print out numbers sub zero. Right. Now, this may or may not be a segmentation fault. I don't know how REPL works, but it certainly should be undefined behavior. OK, it works. Darn it. Uh, let's go ahead and go with numbers of 499 is equal to, oops, is equal to 1.54, whatever. Right. And let's print that one out instead, 499. Generally, you have, to, uh, you have to go to the end to get it to actually, OK, darn it. I'm not going to be able to force. OK, let's go ahead and go with large, uh, and then n minus 1, and n minus 1 there. Come on. There we go, finally. Yeah, you, go, you make it big enough and it eventually will fail because uh, if you ask for 50 megabytes and, and, and then you say, okay, you can have this 50 megabytes back, there's a higher, uh, a higher probability that it's going to be reusing that for uh, other system processes. If you ask for a tiny little amount of memory and it gives it to you and say, okay, you can have that back, it's less likely that it's going to grab that tiny little chunk and use it for something else. So make it big enough and it will fail. Right? And uh, what if I free it again? So what if I free it twice? Hopefully. Yep. I freed it once. You can't free it twice because it no longer belongs to you. Once you free something, it's gone. Right? There's, uh, in, in one particular instance, we saw that it, it worked for us, but that was because the memory chunk was small. In general, you have no uh, way to access that memory again. Once you free it, it's no longer yours. You can't free it again. You can't access it again. So make sure that you're absolutely sure that you're done using it before you free it back up. Right? Uh, or uh, before, yeah, before you free it. Failure to free res uh, unused resources makes them unavailable to the OS or other programs, or even your program. This leads to wasted resources and memory leaks. Right. Memory leaks are just simply you grab a bunch of memory and then you forget about it. Maybe you even lose the pointer to it. Here's another example in REPL. So uh, I've created this memory, uh, and then, I don't know, Let's go ahead and go with numbers is equal to null. Right. Can I free numbers now? What did I do here? On line six, well, on line seven, I asked for, what is this? Half a million? Half a million doubles. So here you go, here's your chunk of memory. I've got my pointer to it, numbers is pointing to this chunk of memory right now. And then I say, okay, change this pointer and make it point to nothing, that thing over there. What about this chunk of memory over here? Does, it still belongs to me, right? But I have no way of referencing it. I can't say free that chunk of memory over there because I lost my pointer to it. 
So if I try to free up a null pointer, what do you think happens? Remember Bret Hart's advice. What happens if you try to dereference a null pointer or try to work with a null pointer? Oh, in this case, it's nothing. Oh, that's surprising. Uh, let's find out why. Uh, what is, is there a special free function does not return a value, blah, blah, blah. All right, here. Uh, man, malloc, grep, null. Let's see what it says about null. If the pointer is null, realloc is, uh, that's realloc. Uh, if the size is zero, the pointer is not null, and okay, no. If pointer is a, a null pointer, no operation is performed. Hey, there we go. There's the, there's, there, there's the reason why nothing happened. If you said, okay, I've got the, uh, I, I'm, I'm making it point to this, uh, this chunk of memory, make it point to null, it says, I can't free nothingness. So I'm not going to do anything. Right? It doesn't end up with a segmentation fault at all. But what about this chunk of memory still over here? I can't free it up because I no longer have a reference to it. It just sits there until my program is ended. And then the operating system collects everything back up and, and frees it. Right? It's not like your, that memory is wasted forever on your computer. You shut your computer off, turn it back on, it's all back to normal. Uh, your, your program ends, the operating system will re reclaim all the resources automatically. But as your program is running, you can have memory leaks like that. And if you do that over and over and over again, you'll, you'll start to grind everything to a halt. You'll do this in lab next, uh, uh, next week, uh, where we, we give you a program with an intentional memory leak. Uh, we have you run it, and then we have you look at, uh, look at the system resources. And the, the, the memory usage on that program goes up and up and up and up. Uh, and if you really want to screw around with it, go ahead and uh, increase the memory resources by a factor of 10 or 20 or something like that, and watch it go up and up and up and up, and see if you can kill off a uh, CSE entirely. Right? And then, then, we'll, then we'll be getting a phone call, I'm sure. Right? But you, you can try it. Go ahead. Right. All right. So. Uh, but you could do it. Uh, we, we've done it before. I think that user le le level system processes are li limited to uh, several gigs of virtual memory. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how much, uh, but try, go ahead, try to break it and see if you can uh, uh, take all the memory on the CSE system. Right? It has quite a bit of memory. Uh, let's just try it. A CSE. Or we won't try it right now, but let's see how much memory they have uh, top. Uh, let's see. So this is how much kilobytes of memory they, they're, they're, uh, that's going on right now. So that's 13 gigs because it's in kilobytes. Uh, that's uh, how much is being used. That's how much is free. So that's going to be two gigs is free right now. So uh, and then cache memory. Uh, is there a percentage? No, it doesn't look like there's a percentage. 55 users are on there right now. Uh, Okay, that, that, I think that, that that's a user in here. Uh, they're running ADOT out, and they're using oh, that, that, there they are. They're using 100% of the CPU. Somebody's in uh, 322 is right now is using. Uh, come on, keeps changing. They're using more than. Uh, how can you use more than 100% of a CPU? Yeah, you're using two CPUs, right? And I think that the CSE has I think 32 cores or maybe 64 cores. I'm not sure. Uh, and, uh, and, and and so you can uh, use as much memory as you want on, on uh, in your uh, uh, lab on Tuesday. You'll you'll witness this. You'll, this is actually what you'll run, and then you'll look at your process. Uh, there I am. There's the only thing that I'm running, but you'll look at your own processes. And right now, it's only it's only using 0.003 percent of the memory. That's because it's a good program. Imagine if you used 50 percent of the memory, 75 percent of the memory. 99% of the memory, right? it, it's, and you won't be able to get to up to 100 because some memory is reserved for the system. But you can try to break it and see how much memory you can actually get. Right? Uh, and th that's why memory leaks are dangerous. It'll grind a system to a halt. All right. All right. Uh, let's see. Anything else? No. Nope. So when we come back next time, we'll look at several exercises. I'll go ahead and put those up right now if you want to take a look. Uh, but we'll write a program uh, to allocate integer, integers, fill them up, print them out. Uh, and then we'll look at using uh, uh, arrays with functions. How do you pass an, uh, an array to a function? How does a function return an array that it's, uh, that it's been created? That's been created? Okay.